What's up, everybody? And you're about to be blessed, I hope at least, with this message. But I do want to say something. I want to say if you're enjoying these messages, I think you'll really enjoy my podcast. That's right. The Darius Daniels podcast. See, my sermons are proclamation, but my podcast is conversation. I have guests and we have conversation and explanation about everything as it relates to faith, life and culture. If you've ever heard me say something when I'm speaking and you're like, what does that mean? Unpack that a little bit more. You will love the podcast. I want you to download and subscribe today, wherever you get your podcast, the Apple platform, Spotify, you name it. And I believe it's going to add value to your life. Well, you're about to hear a message that's a part of my hidden figure series. The message is called No Shame in My Game. If you've ever dealt with shame, this message is for you. Take care. Enjoy. Luke chapter 7 verse 36 says when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was at the Pharisee's house. So she came with an alabaster jar of perfume. She stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair kissed them and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisees who invited him saw this, he said, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. I want to pause for the cause. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. No shame in my game. No shame <laughs> In my game. Family, this passage presents to us one of the most prominent women in the New Testament. She is known as Mary from Magdala or Mary Magdalene. Although she was not one of the 12 apostles, she traveled extensively with Jesus being one of his followers. Followers, She was so connected to the cause of Christ that in Luke chapter 8 verses 2 through 3, the doctor Luke lets us know that she was supporting the ministry of Jesus out of her own limited means. Some historians list and label her, watch this, as the second most influential woman in the New Testament besides Jesus's mother. She is mentioned more than 12 times in the Gospels, which is more than most of Jesus's disciples. She was present with Jesus in some of the most significant situations in his life and ministry. Listen to this. When others were absent, she was present. When the disciples intentionally abandoned Jesus because of fear of reprisal for being associated with him, she was there. When others demonstrated an unwillingness to be associated with him because it was unpopular to be associated with him, she was there. When Peter denied him, she didn't. When Thomas doubted him, she wouldn't. When James and John jockeyed for positions of prominence and promotion, she just digged the scene with the Mary Lean. Whoop, whoop. She just played her position. She didn't need stage. She didn't need spotlight. Her motives and her motion was pure. When they crucified him at the cross, she was there. And on that Sunday morning, when he got out of the grave, she was on her way to the tomb to anoint his body. She was also one of the first people to be instructed to carry the message that Jesus was resurrected. Jesus told Mary, go tell the disciples, I got up. St. <laughs> Augustine from Hippo, that North African bishop, said that Mary was an apostle to the apostles. In case I hadn't painted a clear picture. Mary was a bad sister. And I came today to unashamedly announce that if Jesus needed a Mary, so do we. Every man that wants to be like Jesus needs to have a woman in his life that's willing to be like Mary. They need a mama that'll be like Mary, a sister that'll be like Mary, a daughter that'll be like Mary, a wife that'll be like Mary, a fiance that'll be like Mary, a friend that'll be like Mary. Mary 
was ride or die. When they crucify you, she there. When they leave you, she there. When they like you, she there. When they don't, she is there. We need a, a Mary. And the enemy knows that our culture needs Marys. Our companies need Mary. Our communities need Mary. Our churches need Marys. So the adversary does everything in his power. He throws everything in his arsenal at Mary's. Watch this. Don't miss this. Because he wants to keep Mary's hidden. <laughs> yeah, he wants to keep Mary's hidden and held hostage. But I believe that this Mary from Magdala, a city not too far from Galilee, uh, this, this, this woman named Mary Magdalene, excuse me, from a city in Galilee, this, this woman offers some amazing insight for those of us who are watching and receiving this revelation today. It's, it's interesting because the text says that Jesus is invited to a religious leader, a Pharisee's house. Now, we later find out this Pharisee is named Simon. Mary isn't even invited. She didn't even get an evite. She didn't get a text or a DM saying what's going on. She find out Jesus is at the house and she crashed the party. See, you need somebody like that <laughs> in your life. They say, oh, you scared. If you scared, say you scared. Yeah, I'm not afraid. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. So she operates with a degree of boldness. It's interesting. And she goes to a party. She wasn't even invited to. She's going through the crowd excuse me excuse me excuse me and then watch this she comes with a gift that wasn't even for the house she comes with a gift that was for the guests in other words she's clear she's clear she's a woman that's clear I'm not gonna bother this but she's she's gone through so much God has used the pain of a past to condition her personality to the degree that she's not imprisoned by the opinions of others. And so she can walk unashamedly in a room with a whole bunch of other people and say, I love y'all, but I'm not here for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love y'all, but I'm not here for you. I am here for him. And your stares are not going to run me off. Your murmuring is not going to run me off. And your opinions about whether or not I deserve to be here is not going to run me off. When you got a merry attitude, you don't let anybody put you out of where Jesus plants you to be. Somebody better help me today. Yeah, she's a woman that's, that's clear. So she takes her valuables, this alabaster box filled with expensive ointment, breaks it. She begins to weep and wash and wipe his feet. And it's interesting because Simon, the host, says to himself, now wait a minute, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Now watch this. I wonder why Simon would say something like that. Because he's confused <laughs> at how Jesus is not treating this woman the way he would treat her. He's thinking if he knew who she was, if he knew what she'd done, he wouldn't be allowing her to engage him the way she's engaging him. Watch this. I love it. But Mary kept on wiping. Simon kept on thinking, but Mary kept on wiping. Don't miss this family. I believe that her activity is an indication of a number of things, but I want to suggest today that her activity was an indication of her liberation. This was one free woman. And because she was free, she was able to wipe his feet with a house full of people observing. Because she was free, she was able to observe where, where Jesus needed her the most and respond to that observation. Because she was free, her name is eternally etched in the book of the Bible. And watch this. And no woman can make the impact that they've been called to make. No man can make the impact that they've been called to make. Watch this. You cannot be fruitful 
fruitful until you become free. I want you to catch this. You cannot be fruitful until you become free. You're going to be imprisoned by the opinions of people who, who have, watch this, who have a perspective on what you're supposed to do with your perfume. Y'all missed it. That's a gift she brought to Jesus. Y'all missing this. Yeah, the alabaster box represents her gifts. And people are going to have opinions about what you're supposed to do with your gifts and how you're supposed to use your gift. Watch this. And who's supposed to have a gift? Right? Because they probably think that a woman like this shouldn't have a gift like that. But they forgot that God places his treasure in earthen vessels. And everybody is going to have an opinion about who's supposed to have a gift like that and what you're supposed to do with it. Do you know that there are people that are not fruitful with their gift because they're not free? It's not because they're not gifted. They're not free. It's not because they aren't faithful. They aren't free. It's not because they aren't anointed. They aren't free. It is not because they don't have divine authorization. They got divine authorization, but they're waiting on human permission. So they are not free. This is a free woman. Her freedom is expressed in her ability to freely use her gifts for Jesus. Are y'all catching this? Y'all flowing with this? This woman, what does she do? She uses her gifts, breaks this box, come on, watch this, and puts it on Jesus' feet. What does Jesus' feet represent? It represents the body. So she's using her gifts on the body of Christ. She's pouring out her gifts on the body of Christ. Here it is. So, so there are some gifts that don't get poured out on the body of Christ until some people get free. Are you hearing me, what I'm saying? Yeah, I said there are some gifts that don't reach certain places in the body. Y'all missing this, right? She didn't, she didn't use it for his arms. She didn't use it for his face. She put it on his feet because every gift reach a different place in the body. And when you don't steward your gift well, there are places in the body that go untouched. Y'all are missing what I'm saying. You see, I grew up in a preaching, which is a proclaiming context. And I believe in proclaiming. Jesus had a threefold ministry, a teaching ministry, a preaching ministry, and then a deliverance ministry. So he healed, performed exorcisms, etc. So I grew up in a preaching, proclaiming, inspirational, encouraging context. That's important. That's necessary. But I'm I am analytical, I'm pragmatic, and I'm practical. So I needed something to help me not just be inspired. I needed something to help me execute, right? And then when I got to college in Jackson, Mississippi, I got exposed to the teaching ministry of a man named Henry Hankins. And so he taught to me. I was like, okay, now this is a little different because now I'm not just being proclaimed. It's being explained, and I know what to do with it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so I wouldn't be here today in ministry if it were not for the contribution of that man who, who knew where to put his alabaster box. Did you hear me? See, I wouldn't have been reached the way I got reached by another person's gift. It's nothing wrong with those gifts, but I needed something a little more. I needed something to, that, that would reach me not just here, but that would convince me here. And so when I got underneath his ministry, it reached me. See, there are some me's that aren't being reached because some you's won't use your alabaster box. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There are some me's that aren't being reached because some you's won't use your alabaster box. You got divine authorization, but you're waiting on human approval. She was free. She said, this is mine. I'm going to put this where I'm supposed to put it. I'm going to put this on the place. <laughs> you feeding his stomach, you didn't need me to bring food. He full already. Why do you want me to do what you do? Because you want me to get in line behind you. <laughs> Y'all miss it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I did the same thing that you do, you don't want me to do it at the same time. You want me to get in line behind you. And you want me to watch you do it and wait until you're done doing it so I can get my turn. But there's another place in the body that's not being reached. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? You got to catch this because if not, you will make an idol out of what looks like it works instead of being faithful to your work. Did you hear what I'm saying? You'll see what's hot and what's popular and you'll try to become a clone of that and you will compromise the authenticity of your own gifting and your own anointing because you'll be a slave to what you think works instead of doing your work. And when you aren't doing your work, there's some feet in the body that aren't being touched. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes, sir. I've got to work my gift. Because my gift work my way reaches a part of the body other gifts won't reach. Are you here? So this woman is free. I love this. You say, Pastor, what, what is she? What do you think she's free from? She could be free from a number of things because there are a number of things that hold us hostage, right? Like fear and rejection and, and, um, and per perception. Like we don't want to be perceived a certain way. I don't want to look like um, I don't want to look like them, right? So, all those so there are a number of things that could hold us hostage. But in the text, I see something real unique that held her hostage. I want to unpack it a little bit that tried to hold her hostage. Here it is. And it's shame. See, y'all didn't, okay, y'all didn't read the text with me. Uh, the text says, verse 37, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life. That's the text? Okay, so these are small villages now, right? This is not Atlanta town. This is not New York town. This is not Philly. These are small villages, Okay. So they knew who she was. That's why the host at the home said, if Jesus knew what kind of woman this was. So it's one thing to have a private past. <laughs> oh, Lord, y'all are talking to me. <laughs> it's one thing to have a private past, right? It's one thing to have a past and then you move to another city. And so then people knew, meet you in your evolved state but they don't have any memories of your evolution. But, but, but no, no, that's not, that's not her story. That's not her story. I mean, this woman, this woman, you know, she, she wasn't uh, married the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when this woman got married, it wasn't a white dress. She wasn't Esther. Come on, Esther, Esther never been in trouble. Esther did everything her, her cousin Mordecai said. Esther came home at the right time at prom. She didn't go to parties in college. She never got high, never got drunk, never messed with anybody she shouldn't have messed with. That, that's Esther's story. That's not Mary's story. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse 9, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven devils. Yeah, this is this, this the woman I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. And people looking at her saying, look at you. Talking about you got a gift for the body. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't, they, 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 don't, don't want to hear this today, do you? I'm coming, though. I'm coming, and I'm not backing up. My foot's on the gas. I'm not putting it on the brake. It's in drive. It's not going in park anytime soon. I said the enemy wanted to use that shame to keep her hostage. You, you got a gift. You? Oh, she say she in church now. Whew. He say he changed now. But this, this Mary teaches us something. She teaches us we can't be fruitful until we free. We read about her. We learn about worship because of her. 
She not only you. Like we don't even Simon. We don't know what he did. He grew up in church. We don't know what he did. He we 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 have no recollection. There's no recollection. There's no recording of the contribution that he made. But this woman right here, we reading about her now. We learning from her now. She's been dead for thousands of years, but we learning from her now. I love it. And I and I could imagine what it felt like and I could imagine the instrument. See, watch this. Everybody say hostage. Okay, hostage. See, I, I love this. I love this because whenever someone's held hostage, there's always or there is often an instrument that's used to keep them hostage. A rope, chain, a weapon of some sorts. Got me? So to get free, they got to get free from the instrument <clears throat> that's being used to keep them in bondage. Did you hear what I'm saying? See, it's one thing to know I'm bound. It's another thing to know what is the enemy using to keep me bound, right? I'm bound with anger. See, that's not enough. What is he using to keep you bound with anger? I'm bound with fear. That's not enough. What instrument is he using to keep you bound with fear? And I see right here in the text three things he was trying to use to keep her bound with shame. I don't know if y'all are ready for these. Get ready because I'm on something different this month. You should have seen that already. We on something different. Here it is. We ain't playing. I'm in my all. I'm in my assignment. I'm being me. Here it is. I'm too old right now. I'm 40. I'm too old. I'm 40. I'm too old to be playing. I'm not playing. Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. The first instrument I see in the text that the enemy tried to use to keep up bound was religion. See, I knew I was going to get that response right there. I see it right here. The text says it was a Pharisee. So, so the man who said, I, if, this, if Jesus knew what kind of woman this was, right, if he was a prophet, I thought he was a prophet because he got to know what kind of woman this is, that was a religious man. So if he would have had his way, he would have been like, don't use your gift on the body. Don't you touch Jesus. Don't use your gift on the body. That's what a religious man would have told her. Now, I don't know. Come, come here. Come here. Nothing ruins your potential like bad religion. I didn't say religion. I said bad religion. Here it is, because bad religion makes you hold on to toxic views like they're sacred. That's why it's so damaging. It's hard to let it go because you're associating something that's killing you with being Christian. You don't even know it's toxic, but you're holding on to it like it's sacred. Y'all aren't talking to me. It makes you feel strong about what's wrong. And you will fight for what's killing you. Simon represents bad religion. And he's a Pharisee, so he's a leader. Are y'all ready for this? He's a Pharisee, so he's considered an expert in the Torah. He, he doesn't just read the Bible, he knows it. He's quoting scriptures, using that Bible, but y'all not ready, because there is no neutrality in spirituality. I'm sorry, okay? I'm going to say that. I know that's not popular. There is no neutrality in spirituality. You rocking with God or you rocking with the enemy? You are being used by God or you are, you are being used by the antithesis of him. In the name of religion. Paul talks about this in the New Testament when he talks about doctrines of devils. So it is satanic ideology perpetuating itself as religious doctrine. And people are deceived. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. See, even in the Garden of Eden, even in the Garden of Eden, Eve, in the Garden of Eden with Eve and in the wilderness with Jesus, you see the same thing. The devil using God's word to try to destroy God's people. The devil used the word too. Y'all, I'm, I'm getting ready to go. <laughs> I said the devil used the word too. 
Come on, Jesus. Jump off that cliff. Jump off that. The, the Bible say he's given his angels charge over you. He uses the word. We say, the, right? We say, you know, the devil called the Bible. The devil uses it. And he used twist scripture and twist the words and have Mary's holding on to the alabaster box when the body needed it. He used religion, bad religion. And at some point, you got to accept some stuff that was handed down to you, was handed down to you by people who love you. And they meant well. And they gave you what they had at the level they were taught. And some of it served you well. But some of that food they serve you made you sick. Simon represents a graceless version of Christianity. And a Christianity without grace is one that is without Jesus. How in the world can we spend our whole life telling people, change, God will change you, God will turn you around, God will change you, God will sanctify you, God will make you different. And then when people get changed and get different, we don't believe them. No, get back over there. You, you, not, you can't be, you keep your alabaster box to yourself. That part of the body don't need it, even though I'm not touching his feet. No, no, don't go minister to the homeless, but, but I'm not going. Yeah, no, don't pray for people, but I'm not going to. Religion. Number two, rifts. Rifts. What's rifts? That's a break in relationships. I imagine that out of all the people in that house, all the, you, know, you know somebody was talking. And you know somebody was talking. If it's a small village, you know somebody was talking that she probably had a riff with. Come on. There's no way she's walking in the house and probably not seeing somebody that said something and she heard about it. Why are you talking about rifts? Because rifts can cause so much heartache that the heartache makes you hesitant to use your alabaster box on anybody else. Y'all ready for this? Because rifts make you pain averse instead of passionate about purpose. What does that mean? It means that you're really spending your life trying to avoid pain and not pursue your purpose. Jesus bled, what make you think you're not? I'm telling y'all, this. I feel a different kind of anointing on this. I said, yeah, Jesus bled, what make you think you're not? You can't pursue purpose and not bleed. And when you had rifts, you'll spend your life just like, I don't, want, I don't want no pain. I don't want no mess. I don't want no mess. I don't want no pain. I don't. And you let the body suffer. You know what that is? That's a rope. That's tying your hands. And last but not least, I'm sure he wanted to use the rope of regret. The rope of religion, the rope of rifts, and the rope of regret. Regret is the, is the womb that gives birth to shame. Yes, we should feel a degree of conviction. Shame comes when we violate the des designer's way, but it comes, this conviction comes to correct us. But condemnation, which manifests itself as shame, comes to paralyze us. The enemy wants to make it permanent because shame robs you of your boldness and boldness is needed to become all God's called you to be. In the Old Testament, God told Joshua, be bold. In the Old Testament, God told Gideon, be bold. In the early church in the book of Acts, the apostles prayed for boldness. Being bold doesn't mean being brash, but it does mean to have courage. So here's my question. 
what can this sinful woman with a past that Jesus had to cast seven devils out of? So I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've done. Here's my question. Has Jesus had to cast seven devils out of you? If not, you're not in worse condition than Mary. But the enemy wants to use that rope of religion, the rope of rifts, and the rope of regret to keep you hostage. My pastor told me one time, um, I regret a lot of leadership decisions I made. I, you, start, you, you start young, and you just, you just make decisions. You got to learn. So there was a season of my life, and if you've been with me for at least five years or so, then you know this. There was a season of my life where I traveled way too much. And so about five years ago, I had to recalibrate my life and, um, and um, had to wrestle with regret of, of probably like a two or three year period that I don't even remember. Like I was at games with, with my kids, I like, but I don't even remember. It's like 2013 to 2015. It's just like, it was like a blur. And so for years, I wrestled with that because I knew I couldn't get those years back. I, I just knew it was not, I couldn't get him back. And my pastor told me one time, he said, son, if looking back in regret in any way could help you, if it could help you a little bit, I'd let you do it. He said, you only look back to learn the lesson. Once you've learned the lesson, looking back only distracts you from putting forth the energy and effort you need in the future, in the present, so you can redeem the time you lost in the future. You can get it back. On the front end, you can't go back, but you can make up for it on the front end. He said, if it could help you in any way. Now I know what Paul meant when he said, forgetting those things that are behind me. Reaching for what's in front of me. I, I press. Because there's a place in the body that needs your ointment and it'll be untouched until you break open your box but you can't break it open until you break free man and woman boy and girl a bondage from shame father I thank you I thank you for your word oh I love your word it is my daily bread thank you for speaking to us I pray for liberation now. Break the yokes that hold us hostage. Give us confidence to walk in our own uniqueness. Give us strength not to compare our callings and make us passionate about the part of the body you've called us to reach. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that message. I hope it added value to your life. I only ask that you do one thing. And that is, if it helped you in any way, would you share it with someone else? That's the only thing that I ask. My mission is to help as many people as possible, and I can't do that without you. So I want to thank you in advance for helping me spread the word and introducing and exposing this ministry to people who may not be aware of it. Thank you in advance for that. Also, I, I've got to thank you for your generosity. Many of you uh, you're blessed by this ministry and you bless it back financially. You bless Change Church and others of you, you bless Darius Daniels Ministries. We just want to thank you for that, for your support. It means the world. And also want to remind you, if you're enjoying these sermons, I really think you'll enjoy my podcast. Sermons are proclamation. My sermons are conversation. And I have some of the best guests amazing guests in the world and we talk about have conversations about everything from faith life and culture i believe it'll add value to your life so go to apple that podcast platform or spotify and subscribe download it and give me a rating we want to help reach as many people as possible and i can do that with you take care see you next time